Welcome back to Let's Make a Game, a channel about making computer role-playing games using the free program Twine and the Sugarcube format for Twine. In this video, I'm going to continue my series on adapting the board game Source of the Nile, and this time I'm going to talk about what happens after you win a battle. So I've set up an expedition here and set off into, um, into the wilderness, and we did meet a group of locals who turned out to be unfriendly, and we won the battle against them. Um, and all of that is uh, stuff that we've already talked about. Um, but there's also some new stuff. It says no enemy survives the battle, and we have a new uh, dice roll, and it says that we find our foe's village, and we have a choice. We can forgive our foes and continue on our way, um, or we can loot the village. And if we loot the village, we can see that we got a canoe, and we got, uh, looks like we got some rations as well. So, and then when we continue, um, you know, the we continue on our journey in the same way that we've seen before. Um, but we've got a new system here for dealing with um, uh, for dealing with what happens when we win. If we decide to forgive our foes, um, you'll see that I've got a new heading uh, in the sidebar, as well as the, how the day and how far in, inland you are, and then the sort of the character sheet, i.e. the stats of the expedition. Um, we've got this thing here that says you have zero victory points. So we've added a new variable um, to keep track of victory points. If we decide to forgive our foes and continue on our way, then you'll see that we have one victory point, actually says one victory points, which is uh, something that I have to fix. But we'll talk briefly about that, but we're mostly going to talk about um, how, the, um, how it works after a battle. So let's have a look at the code, I will say very briefly, there is a new variable. And the new variable is dollars $VP, um, which stands for victory points. And uh, victory points are very important in the game, of course. Um, usually, the original game is, a, is a, usually a multiplayer game. Um, and so whoever gets the most points wins, of course. Um, or the first person you can you can say the first person to get to a certain amount of points wins. Um, the solo uh, rules in the game just say that you have a certain target of points to get, and if you get that that many points, then you win, and if you don't, you lose. Um, I'm going to make it a bit more complicated than that. I'm going to have a a sort of rival explorer who is controlled by the computer and you compare how you do to them, so you don't quite know how many points are enough, which seems to me to be slightly more interesting and also slightly more realistic. But um, when, there's quite a few things that we've already done that give you victory points, but I haven't I haven't coded in the the uh, the changes to points yet. Um, that that's something I'm going to do in the near future. But just for now, dollars VP is the number of victory points. So let's go to and. In story caption, I have a um, a line that says you have dollars VP victory points, which I will need to change slightly to account for the possibility of having one victory point, uh, which is a common and easy mistake to make. Um, if you want to get around it, you can just go something like v, you know, victory points colon and then just print the number. Um, but I prefer to communicate in more conversational English, I guess, if I can. Um, maybe in a science fiction setting, I would be more comfortable with having that sort of, that, that, that you know, VP colon something, because um, that just feels appropriate. But for a, something that's set somewhere vaguely in the 19th century, um, it seems more natural to say you have such and such victory points. Um, but anyway... Uh, let's look at the main thing that we're here to look at today, which is after victory and loot. 
Now, this um, uses the policy number that you initially chose. And uh, up to now, I had the policy number or the policy uh, stored in the variable Z, but then I used the variable Z later on um, in the in the in working out what happens. Um, so what I've done to avoid that is I've set the variable PO to be specifically what policy you choose. So um, policy, by the way. Isn't the word that I would use. That's just what the that's just what the game rules call it. It just means what do you choose to do when you meet um, locals? Do you approach them in a friendly manner, or do you uh, stop travelling and you know go on guard and so on and so on? But they they call that a policy. So I've just kept that idea. Um, although the word policy isn't used in the game, as in the the player will never see the word policy. It's just it's just in the code. Um, so we use dollars PO for that. So I did change um, the page where you choose uh, you choose your policy, but the difference is just that it sets PO to to a number rather than Z. So not worth going through that in detail. But so let's say we've won. We've gone through. We've either uh, killed them all with musket fire, or or we've won in a in a sort of pitch battle, or we've killed them all, or they've surrendered. And we get to um, we go uh, we go to victory. We um, deal with the specialist death if we if we have to, and then we go to after victory, or if we um, sort of killed them all with with musket fire before we came to to to, to blows, then we don't have to do that because there's no chance of a specialist dying. Um, but either way, we've ended up at after victory. So. We set z equal to 1 to 6, a random number between 1 to 6, which of course simulates rolling a die. We're going to use the variable y, which is how many enemies are left. And if it's less than 1, then we say no enemy survives the battle. And we set y equal to 0, just in case, um, uh, in case it's gone to a negative number because we've the en we've killed more than there are, which is quite likely to happen because you just generate a number for how many you've killed. Um, if we roll a six in this initial roll and the number of guards is greater than the number of specialists plus the player character, then the idea is that the guards sort of go, uh, go crazy. They kind of lose... Um, you know, they, they're, they're overcome by bloodlust or something and they murder anyone who tries to surrender. And thus, we set y equal to zero as well. Otherwise, we set y equal to the higher of zero, or the highest of zero, the number of guards, which is what dollars $ex square bracket 5 n square bracket is, the number of guards minus that, minus that, die roll, or the number of enemies that were left, because of course we can't take more prisoners than there were people there. So we have a, so, so generally the number of prisoners is going to be the number of surviving guards minus the roll of a single die, with a um, couple of exceptions. Obviously, if there's not enough prisoners, not enough people, then we won't, we, it'll be reduced to the number of surviving enemies, and there's this chance that they roll a six. Then we have a message that tells the player what happens. So if y equals zero, all your foes are dead or escaped. If y equals one, sorry, this is within this, this is within this else. If y is zero, then we say, well, all the foes are dead or escaped. If y is one, you take a single prisoner. Otherwise, you take y prisoners. So we've done the thing there that I should have done with the victory points, but forgot to do, i.e. have a different message for if the value is one. Then we have to roll to see if we find the enemy settlement. And the way that works is we roll two dice, and if the total is less than or equal to the number of prisoners taken plus the policy that we adopted, then we find the 
uh, we find the village and that gives us a, a choice of whether to, to loot it or not, um, generally speaking. Um, there's a couple of important exceptions which we'll get to. So we set x equal to random 1 to 6 plus random 1 to 6, i.e. the roll of two dice. We tell the player, at least we, now that we're in sort of testing phase, we tell the player what we rolled. And then we either tell the player, yep, you found your, you found their village, or no, you can't. Um, and W is set to 1 or 0 to indicate, uh, to, to store whether we found it or not. So the more prisoners we have, the more likely it is that one of them will go, all right, all right, I'll tell you where we, where we live. Um, and the more friendly a policy we adopted, the more likely we are to find the village, perhaps because if, we, if we're here, well, obviously our friendliness didn't work terribly well. Um, they attacked us, but perhaps they, uh, in the fiction of the game, perhaps they said, oh, come to our village, it's just down this road, and they let us down sort of the, the right, you know what I mean? S things might have happened that g gave us more clues to where the village was. They might have spoken to us ostensibly in a friendly way and given out a bit of information before the battle happened or something like that. Um, that's what I imagine is the reason for having the, um, the more friendly policy, meaning more likely to find the village. That's my guess anyway. It doesn't say so in the rules, but I'm just, I'm just guessing based on what the rules are. So then... Generally, we'll have a choice, and generally the choice is we can either take what prisoners we have and make them be bearers and loot the village, that's choice one, or choice two, we forgive them and say, don't do that again, and we set off on our way, and that uh, gives us one victory point, because we've, we've acted in a sort of charitable manner, heroic manner, I guess, and it'll look better when we get home, because victory points are a measure of how... Uh, how how um how how good your reputation is as a as a explorer and i suppose that if you go back in, in, you know in the time that we're talking about if you go back and say yeah so we enslaved all of the bearers and we looted their village and took everything of value and left the women and children to die that might you know count less well than if we said well you know we are good christians and we forgave them and we gave them a lecture on living at peace with your fellow man and we left. And, but, you know, that will improve your reputation. Um, so now we look at Y, the number of prisoners, and W, the uh, flag of whether we found the, the foe's village or, or didn't find the foe's, foe's village. If I haven't explained what a flag is yet, it's a variable that is always either zero or one, and it's set to one if a certain condition is met. In this case, you've met the, you've uh, found the village. So if Y is zero and W is zero, well, you have no prisoners and you couldn't find the village and so there's no choice to make. And so it just says, well, continue. You continue on your way, basically. Otherwise, if we did find the village and we rolled a six and the number of guards is greater than the number of specialists plus one to account for the player character, then the guards loot the village, we don't have a choice, and we go to loot. Otherwise, if dollars P2 and dollars P3, sorry, if dollars P2 plus dollars P3 plus dollars P6 is greater than zero, and Y equals zero, um, then it says you forgive your foes and continue on your way. You get a VP and you go to check MP, which is just the next stage in the turn. Um, so what does this mean? Well, dollars P is the array that keeps track of whether a specialist is present. P2, P3 and P6 are a doctor, an anthropologist or a missionary. And doctors, anthropologists and missionaries don't have the choice to loot the village. They sort of have to behave in a slightly more heroic manner, although they can... If the, if the guards get out of hand, then the, the, it doesn't matter whether you've got these people. But you, you, never have the, you can never sort of choose to do it. So in this case, um, we, have no, we have no prisoners, so we can't force the prisoners to serve as bearers, which a doctor, an anthropologist, and a missionary can do that. They just can't loot the village. So we have at least one of those people present. 
and we don't have any prisoners. So therefore, the only option we have is we forgive them and continue on our way. And we, we do get a victory point for doing that because it's a, a I guess it's a, a story about how how uh, um, how charitable and merciful we are. Um, but, but it's not a it's not a choice that we have. It's not a choice that we as the player have. I guess in the fiction of the game, the the individual doctor has you know can go. Oh yeah, go ahead. But um, they're assumed to be fairly sort of heroic. They haven't kind of um, revealed the sort of evil side to them in the um, you know now that they're out of out of polite society, um, which of course a lot of these people do. You know, a lot of people who um, got to go into the wilds, you know, it turned out they weren't as moral as they presented themselves as. But in this game, every doctor, anthropologist and missionary is, you know, acts in the way that they claim that they believe in uh, while they were in, you know, while they were in civilization, they still act that way in the wilderness. Um, so why do we get a victory point? Well, because um, if we're here, then we must have been able to find their village because to get to this, Y has to be zero. And if Y was zero and W equals zero, then this would have triggered. So if we're down here, if we're if, if this code triggers, that means W must be one. In other words, we must have found the village, therefore giving us the option to, therefore giving us the opportunity to sort of, uh, you know, mercifully not loot it, if that makes sense. So if none of those... Uh, cases apply, then we have a choice. We can forgive our foes and get a victory point, or we force the prisoners to serve as bearers and we loot the village. De obviously dependent on if we have any prisoners and we found the village. But at least one of those things must be true, because if neither of them was true, then, then this code would have triggered and we would never have gotten down here. So we have the choice. Um, to forgive our foes and continue on our way and go to check MP, which sets VP++. And that's that's sort of fairly straightforward code. It's just a button. The next one is the phrase that appears on the button. This is the destination that happens when we click the button. This is the code that happens if we click the button before we go to that new page. And we could put any amount of code in here, but the only thing we want to do is increment VP by one. But it gets a bit more complicated uh, when we're creating the other button. And the reason for that is because sometimes we'll be saying force the prisoners to serve as bearers, but we don't want to say that if there are no prisoners. And sometimes we'll be saying and loot the village. And we don't want to say that if there's no, if we haven't found the village. So, so the, the message will be different depending on what's happening. Um, and I'll show you how that works. If y equals zero, I have a little note to myself. If Y is zero and this code is executed, that means that W must be one. Well, yes, that's true because um, if W, if Y was zero and W was zero, then we would have executed a different bit of code, um, and W can only ever be zero or one. So in that case, the button says "loot the village," and it takes us to the loot page, which is the other page I'm going to look at in this video. Otherwise, things are even more complicated. The text that will appear on the button is stored in X, as the note says. If Y equals 1, we set X equal to force the prisoner to serve as a bearer. Otherwise, we set X equal to force the prisoners to serve as bearers. Because remember, if there weren't any prisoners, this would have executed. So now we're down here, we know that there's at least, uh, there's at least one prisoner. So the text should say force the prisoner or force the prisoners to serve as the bearers. And then we say if W equals one, which means if we have found the village and dollars P2 plus dollars P3 plus dollars P6 equals zero. In other words, they're all equal to zero because they can only be zero or one. Um, in other words, if we don't have a doctor, a missionary or an anthropologist, then we have the option to loot the village and therefore X should have added to it as well as force the prisoner or prisoners to serve as a bearer or bearers. It should also say comma and loot the village. And then that goes to uh, 
that will go to loot. And if that's not the case, then W will just equal check MP. In other words, it'll go to the next uh, the next phase of the of the turn. We'll just continue on our way. Um, then, having done all that complicated stuff, we print this text, and that will create a button which is the option to either impress the bearers or um, or loot the village. And I will, this is one of these cases where it's probably easier for me to type up an example of what this might look like rather than like looking at this code. It's a little bit, a little bit hard to see what's happening. Um, so I'll give you some examples. So it might say button and then plus X. So X might be, let's say it's that. That's what we would get if we took exactly one prisoner and we had found the village. And then if that was the case, then we then we'd print loot. So we're up to we're up to here. Then we print. Now I'll put this on another line, even though it isn't really on another line in this text, just because it's easier to that'll make it easier to see. And also this tab isn't in the text, but this will make it easier to see what. what the logic of it is. So ex6 equals ex6 plus y, and then slash button. So it'll print something like that. This text will often be different, and this destination might be, instead of loot, it might be check MP. But either way, we'll get something like this. So a button, the text of our, our sort of less heroic option, the place that we're going, some code, uh, which is set dollars ex square bracket six n square bracket equals ex six plus y. In other words, increase the bearers by the number of prisoners, and then slash button to end the button. And so the, the player will have this button or the forgive your foes and continue on your way button. So let's say that we are either forced to, because of the a roll of a six, or we choose to loot and have a look at the loot um, the loot screen, which is mostly a single for loop. That for loop goes down to there, and then there's there's a few different lines, but it's mostly this for loop. The for loop goes from one to dollars. I S dollars I dollars I S is the um, the fighting strength of the particular tribe that's dollars I miles inland dollars I is how far inland you are um, and it's the original strength it's not altered by the results of the battle so if you met twenty warriors and ten of them died this is going to be twenty not not ten so we do so in other words we get as many rolls for loot as we met warriors. And the logic of that, I guess, is that a big band of warriors means a big settlement. So the more war if we meet a tiny group of warriors, well, it's probably a tiny village. And vice versa, a big group of warriors, it's probably a big village. So we set y equals random one to six. In other words, we roll a die. If it is one to four, we get we get rations equal to the die roll. So we set ex9, which is the rations equals ex9 plus y, so plus the number of the roll. If y is five, we get a single gift. So something that we can trade with future, more friendly uh, groups of people. We set ex8 equals ex8 plus plus, in other words, plus one. Otherwise, and that can only happen when we roll a six. Um, if we're in the desert, we get a camel. If we are near water, we get a canoe, and if neither of those things are the case, we get nothing. Now, the original rules aren't clear what happens if you're in the desert and water is present. Uh, maybe you get a choice, but I decided that um, the 
uh, the desert would the desert sort of trumps the the water. If you're in the desert and there's water, you get a you get a camel. So we have this we have this code that we've been using quite a lot, which is if dollars t n square bracket dollars t e square bracket one n square bracket square bracket dollars i n square bracket n square bracket equals equals quote the name of a terrain in this case desert end quote then we set ex two plus plus which is uh, camels the number of camels we get one camel um, we've been doing this quite a lot dollars te is the array that keeps track of the terrain dollars te one i is a number um, representing what the predominant terrain is is it desert plains hills forest forested hills etc etc and then TE2I, which we're dealing with over here, is whether there's water present. Um, but instead of re directly referring to dollars TE1I, I've been using if TN square bracket dollars TE uh, square bracket 1N square bracket square bracket I N square bracket N square bracket equals equals and then the name of the text. Because this, looking at this, it's easy to see what I'm doing. It's easy to see, ah, he's saying if the current terrain is desert. Whereas if I'd put if te1 i, actually let's isolate that so it's a bit easier to read. If te1 i equals equals 4, well what's that? We could look it up. We go to the initialize page and look up the array, but it, um, doing it this way, it's a bit more Sort of cumbersome in coding terms, but it makes it easier for anyone to see what's intended, um, and also makes it less likely to make mistakes. And 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 um, that's quite good because you know often I do make mistakes, and uh, correcting a mistake is is a lot. Uh, what's the word? It's a lot more time finding and correcting a mistake is a lot more time consuming than not making it in the first place. So I would choose, you know it's better for me I think to type out a little bit more. Um, but but sort of have the safety of, of being more likely to get it right. So if we're in the desert, we set ex2++. Otherwise, if $TE2I is greater than zero, and if that's the case, then there is either a river or a lake in this area. If that is the case, then set ex3++, which is canoes. Um, and then there is, no, there is no other else if, so it's just a slash if. So if neither of those are the case, a six represents you're out of luck, and then and and so we just go through the go through that for loop as many times as as the original uh, size of the group of warriors we met, and then it just says you take everything of value that you can find. We include classify expedition. That is an as yet unwritten bit of code which is going to uh, determine whether the um, expedition is on foot or on horseback or on canoes. Because if you get new stuff, that might mean um, that that changes. You, you, you might have uh, not enough, you might have too many people to ride now, for example, or you might get a canoe and it might mean, oh, actually now you can ride because, sorry, you might get a camel and it might say, well, actually now you can, you can ride. You were on foot before and you had almost enough mounts. Um, but now you've got this camel, that's an extra amount, and now you can ride. So that would mean you were going twice as fast. So it makes quite, that can make quite a difference. Usually it won't, of course, but unfortunately there are sort of corner cases where you can tip from one classification to the other, and um, we have to check. And then we have a button that says continue, and it goes to check MP. Now, I don't know how classify expedition is going to work. It might just be that it, it might end up being something like that. Um, I'll have to code classify expedition and then see um, see exactly what happens. I'm not quite clear in my head how it's going to work, but for now I've done it that way. And that uh, ends the um, ends the looting it ends looting and therefore ends the um, the consequences of victory. Um, I think there might. Some of these uh, I'm not completely sure about. I think maybe I, I should have put classify expedition instead of check MP. In other words, I might have there might be some cases where you can tip from one type of expedition to another that I haven't um, 
covered with that with that call to classify expedition, but um, we'll look at that as we go. You know, it's, that'll be easy enough to change. But for now, that's how that works. Um, the next thing I'm probably going to deal with is either being a prisoner, um, as it, yeah, being being captured, or um, when it turns out that the uh, the natives are not hostile, and what what do you do then? Um, but for now, I hope that was useful or interesting to at least some of you, and I hope you will tune in next time.